You can never come into union unless you see identification. Now, it's obvious that the identification that we speak of is a little different than you might read in somebody's book or pick up somewhere else. It is not just that Jesus did it for us, and this is what so many attribute identification to mean, that Jesus did this for us. He identified to our sin, and he did it for us. This is not what we're talking about. We're going into a, another depth to speak of it. He didn't do it for us as much as he did it as us. So we need to bear that in mind all the way. And as we pointed out, I think, in last institute, that it is not in the death of Jesus that he is as us, so that we died as him, or in his resurrection that he comes forth as us, but it is in our sin that he is as us. And this is where our scripture verses began. Jesus is our substitute and the identifier to God of what was necessary to take care of our sin. The horribleness of the cross. Why was the cross so horrible? Why was the image that we have of Christ on the cross so horrible? Because he is in our place bearing our sin and giving to us and to the world an identification of the horribleness of sin. So the very appearance of Christ on the cross is God's love in its greatest depth emphasized, showing what salvation really is. So we look into these scriptures. First, Second Corinthians 5 and 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. First, see yourself in his death. The reason why human beings struggle with salvation, with sanctification, with holiness, with doing right, with living right, is because they've never seen their death. They've never seen their death. Now, I can preach death to you and you get mad. You won't lie. I can preach how you died with Christ and it will stir you for a bit but not do anything to you. What you've got to do is to see your death. You've got to see your death. Somehow the Holy Spirit has to show you that that's not him dying, that's you dying. That's not his death, that's your death. You have to see your death. So. The love of Christ is ever beckoning, Paul says in this 14th verse, ever pulling us to do something. It is holding us and it's pulling us to see that if when Christ died, you died with him, so all were dead. Now going to the cross, and our identification has to be in the literal aspects of what took place in the Christ life. When he finally dropped the dead head on his dead shoulders and cried it is finished and everybody walked away and said he was dead, what God is saying by the Apostle Paul now is that that wasn't just him dead. That was every sinner dead. Now that's how vivid and how literal you have to begin to see the death of Jesus Christ. Not just him dead that's you dead. If one died for all, then all are dead. Second Corinthians 5 and 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now this is a loaded verse. And we want to try to break it down. Notice now. The verse says it was God in Christ at the cross. That's probably not a good translation as we need. It was God as Christ. This introduces us to the very heart theme of the plan of redemption. 
Way back in Genesis, where is it? Genesis 22, uh, Abraham at Moriah, that when they finally reached the place where the sacrifice was to be offered, Isaac said to Father Abraham, where is the sacrifice? And the Hebrew translation of Abraham's answer is one of the most strategic truths in the Bible. For Abraham said, God will provide himself as the sacrifice. Now our King James Version reads, God himself will provide the sacrifice. But that wasn't the whole thing, you see. Lots of times we have to go a little deeper in what the English version is. It says, God will provide himself as the sacrifice. Well, that's, a, that's the first most strategic thing said in the whole of God's plan. To begin to see from the very beginning that the one who will be the sacrificial offering is God himself. Now, prior to that time, we've had several hundred years of the institution of the innocent substitute being killed for the receiving of forgiveness of sins. Started all the way back in Genesis 2 or 3 when God himself slayed an animal and by the shedding of that blood was able to put coats of skin on Adam and Eve and cover their nakedness or their sin. From that time up to Moriah, when Abraham made this statement, God had never let it be known who was represented by that innocent substitute. But one of the greatest strategic truths in the Bible is when Abraham says, God will provide himself as the sacrifice. Now, that's what's behind this 19th verse of 2 Corinthians 5. To wit, that God was in Christ. Why was that said like that? And why is that necessary? God himself is to be the sacrifice. Now, you see, that's the depth that you don't always see when we hear God gave his son to die for our sins. But it is God the Son, God Himself, who is the sacrifice. Well, there's a lot of ramifications to that thing back in Genesis on Mount Moriah. First thing was, the, most Bible scholars believe that the whole scope and plan of God would have been radically changed if Satan had gotten that message from Abraham. because it is believed that Lucifer never knew who would be the sacrifice and how the sacrifice would come about in the world at that time. Now, he could have known it then because Abraham said it properly. In fact, we don't believe Satan ever knew who would be the sacrifice until... Isaiah's day. And Isaiah 7 and 14 is the first indication we think that Satan ever knew how the plan of God was going to materialize and souls would be saved. Because that's the little verse that said, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child and he shall save the people from their sins. That's the first time the devil ever knew that. And the reason we believe that is that at that very time, Satan, working through Antiochus Epiphanes, set out to destroy all little babies, I think under two years of age, just like Herod did later on. Isn't that interesting? The devil didn't know it until then. Now, he fought. He was ferocious all the way through, but he didn't really know until it was finally declared that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son who will save the people. That's first mention that the devil got of a savior. Well, strange as that may seem, the devil got a hold of something 
that mortal men didn't get a hold of them. Of course, I've warned you about the devil. He's very religious. He's spiritually religious. He's powerfully religious. He knows God better than anybody. I'm sure he could uh, uh, bite his tongue for not knowing it before Isaiah's day because I was only about seven, eight hundred years before Christ. So he, you know, he went 3,200 years or so in there not knowing what was going on other than he just attacked what he could. But men didn't come to that knowledge then. The people to whom God was to send his son could have known the most vibrant truth in the Bible, even in Isaiah's day, but they missed it. Just like even to this day, Men are going to miss what it is God is doing by His Son, Jesus Christ, unless the Holy Spirit bears witness. And so you, you know that uh, the devil attacked again, not only in Isaiah's day, but later on when, when it was noised abroad that Jesus, that one who would save the people from their sins, had finally come to the virgin. Uh, he set out and did the same thing again. No, not many new tricks with the devil. Same old thing, had Herod kill all the babies under two years of age, trying to reach that Savior who was destined to dethrone him. Who was destined to dethrone him. Now, that idea takes us into the furtherance of this 19th verse. It was God who died at Calvary and as such reconciled the world unto himself. Now, who is it that separated us from God? Well, Satan. And now by God, being the Savior himself, by God the Son, we see that the whole of what God's intention was to have a family of his own in perfect unity took place at Calvary, and he reconciled the world to himself. He rejoined them back to himself with no separatism intended. Now that, this verse we will study again when we get on the subject of union. But I can't pass this by right now that it is at Calvary that God lays out the aspects of union reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now that little line means that he himself bears the sin and does not pass it on to those who are identified to him. He bears the sin himself. He carries the load himself. That's the glorious hope that every believer has. We know we know now that God carried all our sins and transgressions and that there's nothing we can do about it other than believe. We can't carry any part of it or do anything with any part of it. He bore it all. He reconciled the whole world unto himself by carrying in his own body the sins. Now, this is God in the form of the person of Christ on Calvary. In, in son form, God the Son hanging on the cross. You and I are dying there as him, but he is also setting up the rules of union or reconciliation. How does he do it? How is it that regardless of who and what we are, God joins himself to us so that we're one by not imputing our sins and transgressions unto us, but by bearing them himself. So note this, every time you think God and I are one, Christ in me, the hope of glory, he is my whole life, your nagging, doubtful thoughts that say, how can that be? I'm no good, I'm sinful, are wrapped up in this little line where he says, he hath reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing trespasses unto them. 
What did he do? At the same time you think I'm one with him, God thinks I bear everything that hinders them from being one with me. Oh, union has a powerful message in it in that he and I are one and whatever sorry state I'm in, by his union with me, he bears my transgressions, not imputing my sin unto me, but carrying them himself. Not only that, this verse introduces us to, to the to the heart theme of what I call Christ's life healing, because that's really what's happening to every one of us. We're being healed in, in body and soul. We've been so warped and tormented and browbeat by religion, a healing has set in now in body and soul as we see that Christ did bear it all, that he is our life, that we come behind in no spiritual gift, that he actually becomes us and lives as us through these mortal bodies. And as this... Uh, takes hold, we have a healing that flows out of us that when you get a hold of it in your mind, you'll see it working everywhere you go. What is it? That says you see your oneness with Christ, everywhere you go, the message of reconciliation will flow out of you. Now, how can I explain that? We had a glorious uh, uh, institute this weekend in San Jose, and we had two or three testimonies, if I can recollect them. One young woman says that her son, who has never been interested in any spiritual thing at all, just out of the clear the other day, looked at his mother and said, you're a brand new changed person. What has happened to you? She said, I don't know. What are you talking about? He said, I don't either. He said, you're just a whole different person. Now, he's about 20-something years of age, and you know what he did? He said, you're so beautiful to me now. And they had been at utter odds and ends to where she was wanting to put him out of the house. He said, come with me. And he took her down to a Bible bookstore and bought her a new Thompson Chain Bible, over a $50 Bible, and said, I want to give it to you. <laughs> she said, of course, that would floor you if you knew what our past was. That's, that's the healing that flowed out of her by her oneness. And one that would be the last you'd think to ever recognize it caught the healing flow and the ministry of reconciliation passed to him. Now this is what we're trying to say to the world. <clears throat> that there is a power by Christ being in us that beats anything we've ever tapped. But most of us destroy the effect of the healing Christ in us by opening our mouth and telling others about it. I get a feeling sometimes we'd do a whole lot better if we didn't talk so much. <laughs> because the moment you begin to talk, you have a tendency to leave the being stage and become a doer. Because you just can't talk without getting them to do something. You're like preachers. What good's a service without an offering and an altar call? <laughs> you got to get somebody to doing something. Well, I want to tell you, this verse has locked in it some beautiful truth in that he reconciled us unto himself by death and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What was it? I had another beautiful testimony. Of a, of a family that was having small children problem and the parents were doing nothing but, but chastising and spanking these children to no avail. Now, I believe in spanking, so don't think that's my subject. I think they're good for you at a certain point, but they wasn't making any headway. The children were a little bit too old to, to, to take hold of the effects of it. And so the mother just pulled back and said, Jesus, they're your children. I gave them to you. And I've made a mess trying to raise them because I didn't let you do it from now on. You're the child raiser in this family. Now that's easy to say and hard to do. <laughs> to pull back and to believe that he that is within you will do by his presence what you can't do by your actions. She pulled back, was hard on her. 
She said, I gritted my teeth, said I ranted and raved on the inside, but I was determined to see if this thing worked and said, over a period of two or three weeks, it began to work. The healing began to come out. By my attitude, they began to be healed, the kids. Started coming up and hugging my neck and saying, Mama, what can I do? Just out of the clear. And said I had to beat them to get them to do anything before. <laughs> the healing. That's the reconciliation. Now, you see, that's the way he took us in at the cross. That's how he identified himself with us. He so radically took our place and didn't ask us anything about it. I guess that's what I've got in the back of my mind when I say the difference between doing and being. Jesus never asked us anything about the radical change he was to work in our lives. He didn't ask you if he could be you on the cross. He went ahead and did it. He didn't ask you if you'd be put in that tomb as him or you'd be resurrected as him or ascended as him. He didn't ask you anything. He just went ahead and did it. There's a marvelous thing about the Trinity. They're always doing things without telling us. <laughs> when you got born again, you don't have the slightest idea what happened at the time you saved as to what being born again was. He didn't tell you. He didn't tell you that he did the same thing to you that your daddy did to your mama when he cohabitated with her and put his seed in her and you was born. He, God didn't tell you at all. I'm doing the same thing to you. I'm cohabitating with you, putting my seed in you, and there's going to be birthed another person in you. Well, if he'd have said that to some of you men, you'd have. <laughs> you wouldn't even have understood it. So God doesn't see fit to explain that. He just lets Jesus holler out in John 3, you must be born again. So we all say, yeah, I'm born again. But we had no concept of what happened because God doesn't run around telling everybody everything. That's where we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our growth, we come to know what it is God has done and what he's doing. Oh, he didn't tell you all about reconciliation. And that's a heartbeat of identification. That we have been so reconciled to God by our identification with Jesus Christ that we stand as if we had never sinned. Then not only this, but Jesus became exactly what we were so that when God looked at him, he didn't see Jesus, he saw us. Notice, we didn't become what Jesus was, he became what we were. He became a sinner. Remember one of the things the scripture says, he hath been made unto us is sin. Made unto us sin. So I didn't become him at the cross. He became me. Now that's very important because there are messages today being preached that, that Jesus is becoming the believers. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. I believe that believers are becoming Christ. Big difference there. But when I was a sinner, he became me. The only time Jesus ever became me was when I was a sinner. He became exactly what I was, sin. He was made sin. Now, when God looked at Christ, that's the way he saw him. This may help some of you that wonder why God treated Calvary like he did. I've got, I've always had Bible students and preacher boys that was trying to change the program at Calvary. For instance, God said at one point, uh, <clears throat> or Jesus said, my, said uh, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now that's a little line all preacher boys try to change. 
They say that's not God. God would never forsake his son. That's contrary to everything about God. God never do that. You'll hear radio preachers going town on that. Why don't we leave it alone? We don't know what we're talking about. God's not looking at Jesus hanging on that cross. Who does he see there? Sure, he sees you. That's the heart of identification. He has caused Christ to be made sin. And when Jesus cries, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's not God forsaking his son. That's God turning his back on sin. For the holy God will not look upon nor have anything to do with sin. So who is it God forsakes there? <laughs> forsakes us, old man. Right. He forsakes that old Satan nature because that's what dies at the cross. Well, it's best not change most of the words. Some of them need to be changed. But it's best not change most of the words, especially around Calvary, because God viewed Jesus as if it were you and I dying. And God treated Jesus as if it were you and I. By his stripes we are healed. By his death we have life. So God treated him as though he were with us. And we were identified with him. Look at some of the verses. Back to 2 Corinthians 5. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's the whole capsule of sin and salvation, of union. But notice, this is not the best wording we could have in this 21st verse. For he hath made him to be sin because of us. Him who knew no sin. I think we get an idea that, that there's such a thing as sin separate from Satan. That sin is like something you buy in a package. Or you dip it out of a river or you pull it out of the air. But the sin is the sin of the mortal. The sin of the human being. God made him to be human sin. Because that's what we were. And he never knew sin himself. God made him to be us in sin. But then notice the other side of it is that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is what happened. God poured into Christ at Calvary my sin and death. <clears throat> my sin and death was in him so that it wasn't Christ at all. It was me in sin. That went into death in order that God might be able to pour me into Christ's righteousness, the believer in Christ, in his righteousness that we might ascend to be what it is God has declared us to be. Just as we were made sin, so are we made righteous by another. By another. Now, Isaiah 53 and 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked 
and with the rich in his death. The word death is plural in the Hebrew, deaths. Inclusive of all of us, we assume that means. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Nothing but identification in every aspect. Whenever he went into death, it was death. Every person died the death sin at that point. Need to talk about that a moment. We will get to it when we get to Romans 7. But the death sin that he died is innate sin. That's a technical word, theological term. Innate, original sin. It means the sin of Satan manifested by Adam. That's the sin that he died with. He also, by his death on the cross, brought all sin under subjection because some of these verses have the word A-L-L -L again and again. All sin, all sinners. But it was innate sin that basically was taken care of at Calvary. That's the sin that kills us, that destroys us. That's the sin that Adam participated in as Satan took hold of him back in the garden. That sin was done away with by the death of Christ, the innate sin. So that the believer could from then on have life manifested from him. Now, the believer did not have all his sin done away with like that. That's 1 John 3, where he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's the sin that went into death with him that never came out. 1 John 1 and 7 says, or the first chapter of John's first epistle says, if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. Both of these sins, innate sins and sins of the flesh, were covered by his death. It took death to cover sin. Why? The end of sin is death. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. Whereas by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. It must be done away with by death. Sin can only be done away with by death. Death is all that takes care of sin. Why am I saying it like that? Because you can do nothing at all about it. Sin can only be destroyed by death. Since you can't die and do anything about it, it took the death of another in whom God had put sin. And sin is only destroyed by death. Whether it be innate sin or flesh sin, though so there's a little message that ought to come from this. You cannot cease from your sins within yourself. You cannot stop sinning within yourself because sin cannot be covered nor handled by an activity, by a desire, by even a godly want. Sin can only be destroyed by death. What does Romans 6 say? Reckon. Mind action. Reckon yourself dead unto sin. Why? You are never free of sin till you reckon it to be dead. Now that's why some people go through life with little old besetting sins. And let me tell you what I think sin is. Sin is to a believer if he knows to do right and doeth it not. That's sin. You understand that? Sin is if you know to do a thing inside of you and you don't do it. Between you and God, that's sin. But did you know the thing that you want to do is the thing you have a hard time doing? 
And the thing you don't want to do is what you have great ease in doing. So you can't handle your sin. A lady came to me the other day, and smoking, sure not bad, but I seem to get caught up in it all the time. I guess because I don't like it. I'd rather have a church full of smokers than long tongues anytime. <laughs> so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not just picking on something. But this lady came up to me and she said, I have tried my dead level best for 21 years to quit smoking. What am I going to do? I looked her straight in the eye and said, die. <laughs> die. Because you can't handle bodily sins are sins of the flesh without death. Reckon yourself dead to it. I had an unbelievable event just last week. A uh, fellow who comes to our fellowship in Dallas just started coming. I never had met him. I was home for a day and he got a hold of me and said, I need you to help me. My wife's sick. She's dying with cancer. A heartbreaking story. A woman in her 40s and 30 days ago, she was a secretary working on a job and had life all tied up in a neat little package. Didn't even have pain in her body. But it came time for an annual checkup and the doctor was going over and saw a little spot on her body. I don't remember where it was. He said, let me look at that. He looked at it, pressed around on it, finally cut on it. When the report came back, he said, you're full of cancer. And she was. They made other tests on her. She had cancer in every major organ. Now I'm telling you, she was working every day and didn't have pain in her body. But within 24 hours of that doctor's word, she was at death's door. Couldn't lift a foot, didn't want to get out of bed, didn't want to live. Most ironical thing, she said, I could have gone a few more days probably if I'd have never gone to that doctor and been happy. Finally, she told me, she said, they got it settled where it is there to put the radium. She said, it's my lungs. And you know all the time I was talking to her what she was doing. She's smoking one cigarette after another. <clears throat> and tears rolled down her cheeks and she said, if you can, get a hold of God for me. And I did. I prayed for her and I loved her. But I left that place thinking that that's the way human beings are until she reckons dead. <coughs> that power and authority that obviously has brought on the killing in her body. She's fighting a hopeless battle because the source, the center, the root of the problem has got to be dealt with sooner or later. It was obvious that she knew that. She knew cigarettes had brought her cancer of the lung. But you know what? She wasn't going to do anything about it because she didn't think she could. And she's right. She's probably tried every way she knew how to quit smoking. What do we do with the thing that we can't control. We reckon it dead. That's where identification comes in. You don't have enough strength and power and life to rule over anything in your life and your body. And that's why these powerful scriptures speak as they do. That there had to be somebody else that did that, that had the power to control that, who now has the power to stop that by us declaring that it's dead. It's dead. Whatever it is, whatever the sin of the flesh is, it's dead. But it can only be covered by death. By you saying in your mind, it has no power. It's dead. Now you may have to look at the cross several times. Some of you may have to pitch a tent and stay there a while. 
I had to do that once. I tell you, I wrestle with things and I prayed, God, don't let me leave this cross till I see the death of this thing. See, I wanted to get around it. I wanted to say it's bigger than I am, more powerful than I am. God will have to just jerk it and take it away. No, he said it's dead. You reckon it so. You say so in your mind. It's dead. Now, that's where identification becomes very practical. So Jesus, in his death, took care of sin, whether it's innate sin or sin to the flesh. Now let's move on. Matthew 27 and 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now we were dead in sins, and Jesus became sin and died in spirit, becoming exactly as we were. We were identified with him. This verse we've already spoken of. God did not neglect his son. God turned his back on sin, for he would not look upon it. Now, a little thing ought to be said about this business of death. It not only controls you and your life and what you should rule over, but it controls your relationship with others. What is our problem with people we don't get along with, where we've got a bad relationship working? What's really the problem, especially among believers? The problem simply this. The believers have not seen themselves dead to sin. What's wrong with husband and wife relationship? They haven't seen themselves dead to sin. I'm always telling you, you need to see Jesus in your mate. Maybe we're not starting at the right point. Maybe you need to see them dead first. And maybe you need to reckon that so in your own mind, that whatever they're doing to me is not truth. It's not, it's not uh, fact. It may in fact be an illusion even though it's hurting me because I know them to be dead and their manifestation is not actual. So we also by this death of Jesus Christ control our relationship with other husband and wife, children, parent, and especially in the church. We've got a lot of dead churches, but they're not dead the right way. <laughs> and the answer to that is seeing Christ and having an identification with him in that regard. All in all, it's his death. It's his cross. It's his burial, it's his resurrection, and it's his ascension, all in the person of you and I. It's all in the person of you and I. And that's the very heart of this message, that we are as Christ, throughout all his death, burial, and resurrection. And I think this is important now. Why is it that we are so hard line on Christ? A fellow came to me the other day and he said, don't you know anything but Jesus? Oh, I said, I hope not. <laughs> I used to get radio mail that said, can't you preach something else besides Christ? Why don't you preach a well-rounded gospel? You know, it, it bewildered me because all these were brethren. If you don't preach Christ, what are you going to preach? And of course, what it is, the average believer doesn't know that Christ is all. They think that Jesus just has to do with certain things. 
But that's not the message. Our message is that Christ is all. The Christ life message is that Jesus is all. He's total everything. He's not just a little bit or a part of it. He doesn't just uh, see a sinner coming forward and say, now I'll take away your sin and and uh, he backs off then and says, now you preachers baptize them and I'll give them the other part and you, you deacon board receive them into the church and I'll give them the other part and, and uh, somebody else send them out in the harvest field and I'll give them the other part. He's all. You don't separate Jesus. But this is sort of in our thinking that, that our identification with Christ just only goes so far when actually he's all. Christ is all and in all. The message which God has given us these days is to preach this Christ in this vibrant way. And I want to stress to you, particularly in this institute, the utter importance of you beginning to see Christ as your all, as your total everything. He's not just your Savior. He didn't just touch you years ago, and now then when you get in a good worship meeting, He touches you again. He's your all. He's your life. There is no other life for you other than Christ. Now, I don't know how to handle that in a balance that the world wants. And this is what a lot of you are going to face. When you, when you start dealing with people, you're going to get utterly upset with them that they can't see Christ as all. What else could there be, you'd say? The Apostle Paul said, For I am determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. <clears throat> so the end of all we're doing is bringing us to these aspects of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ being all that we know. We know that by Him who participated in it as us. Oh, don't feel badly. When somebody ridicules you or says there must be something else, I kind of face this everywhere I go. And you'll face it too when you begin to live this Christ. Because men don't want you to be so single-eyed and devoted to the person of Christ as to say he's total everything to you. Because you see, that kind of gets next to people, upsets them. You don't have to say anything, just be that. But I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And God's going to raise up a people in these days who are determined just to see Jesus as their own, only life. And I would urge you here in this place to join with Paul in asking that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. What, what would be that knowledge that Paul prayed for in Ephesians 1? It would be this knowledge of this crucified Christ. It isn't that he was determined to know Christ in all ways, but he said, I'm determined to know Him and Him crucified as a distinctive way. Why? The only place in the Scriptures you get a glimpse of union in a literal sense is in the death of Jesus Christ. The spiritual union we have with Christ must be revealed by the Holy Spirit. But by identification, you can get a vivid picture of your union with Christ as a sinner. That that's Him dying as me. The only way you're going to see Him alive as you in spirit is as the Holy Spirit reveals this to you. For it's just 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10 says, I have not seen, ear can't hear it, hearts can't feel what it is God has to reveal to them that love Him. So we're back to the Holy Spirit. So we have two things working in identification that have to do with union. The first is, as a sinner, you can see that Christ did it for you because it's plainly shown in his death 
that that's not him needing to die at all. That's you. But once he comes into your life, you won't see it and know it until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. That's one of those things God did and didn't ask you about it. But when you fall in love with him, when you really begin to fall in love with Jesus, you won't let go until he reveals that Christ in you because that's the only place to go. Now, you can go just so far in outer things. You can just shout so long, talk in tongues so long, dance in the Spirit so long, fall on the floor so many times. You can just do so many things so many times without moving on. You can give, you can go, you can be a Christian, you can be a good church member, but you can just go so long on that. And at some time and some place, you're going to have to say, God, what's next? Surely you've got something else. Not that there's anything wrong with all those things, and they may continue to your dying day, but some place a hungry believer is going to come to where he says, God, what's next? And he says, now, I'd like to reveal to you what I did to you when you were saved. I want to reveal my son in you. And you're going to get hungry for God before that happens. You're going to have to get hungry for God before that happens. Because he's not dropping that on people. They're not waking up in the middle of the night and finding it. It's Paul saying, I'm praying for you that you by your searching might know what is the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of what is yours in Christ Jesus. It's not going to fall on you. But to every man that seeks God, does he bring it. That's what he's doing for you and I. That's where he's leading us now. 